All right, we'll get started. Hello, my name is Sharon Roberson, President and CEO of the YWCA Nashville of Middle Tennessee. Welcome to the October Stand Against Injustice Lunch and Learn. This month, we will be looking at centering survivors. For those of you who have been part of this series for a number of years, we rebranded ourselves from the Stand Against Racism to take in the broader issue of injustice. As you know, the YW's mission is eliminating racism, empowering women, promoting peace, justice, freedom, and dignity for all. And as October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month, we are using this time to remember our victims, but to also look at some of the issues that we have previously centered as part of our Stand Against Racism series. We want to make sure when we have this very vital conversation about domestic violence and survivors, we also remember that there are disparities in our system based on racial issues that do affect domestic violence and how it is part of our society. One of the things I want to bring to your attention is after years of delay, the Violence Against Women Act was reauthorized in March of this year. Now, VAWA is very significant to domestic violence providers because it provides vital funding to fill in the gaps that often leave survivors and victims vulnerable. We have an absolutely wonderful panel today, and each of them plays a very critical role in our fight against domestic violence. First of all, I would like to thank Nissan Foundation for making these webinars possible and free. This conversation, we hope to build community, spark dialogue, and build a consciousness of legacies of discrimination and oppressive and really injustice to the people in our society who are victims of domestic violence. As I start, I'll ask each panelist to uh, introduce themselves and describe the role that they play to support victims of domestic violence. I will start with Ms. Tina Fox. Good afternoon. Thank you so very much, Sharon and the YWCA for engaging me and engaging the Tennessee Coalition in this important discussion. I am Tina Fox. I serve as the Assistant Director of Programs with the Tennessee Coalition to End Domestic and Sexual Violence. And as we know, we have been recognizing Domestic Violence Awareness Month for approximately 42 years since 1981. And I'm so honored and proud to be among the panelists for this afternoon's discussion. Thank you for having me. All right, uh, Sandra. Hello, my name is Sandra Dominguez. I am the Director of Residential and Crisis Services at the YWCA Weaver Shelter. And my role here is to supervise uh, staff who take our crisis hotlines for any um, individuals, family seeking shelter or resources. Um, what's so funny, you had mentioned VAWA and it was passed in you know, 1994 first. And so it's, I'm 28 years old. And so it's a whole, a whole me. So it's, it's great to see how much uh, progress VAWA is making. Okay, Becky. Thank you, Sharon. And thank you to the YW again, as Tina said, for having all of us here today. My name is Becky Bullard. I'm the Senior Director of Programs at Metro Nashville's Office of Family Safety. And our Office of Family Safety oversees the operation of our two family justice centers here in Nashville. We have a community-based center on Murfreesboro Pike, the Family Safety Center, and then our court-based center, the Gene Crow Advocacy Center. So I oversee our client services programming, training and technical assistance, and all of our high-risk teamwork that involves many of our partners that are on this call. And I have been doing this work for almost 20 years. So Sandy, you're making me feel like an old lady here, but um, it is amazing to see how much how much we've grown in this work. And I'm excited to talk about that with everyone today. All right. One thing we do know from our very for our previous series that there are disparities in our society. We also know that there are layers of domestic violence, the physical, financial, and emotional. I want to start off at looking at the larger societal issues that contribute to the perpetuation of domestic violence and really maybe some things that are systemic that lead us to having difficulties in tackling this very critical issue. I'll start with you, Becky. 
Yeah, I think there are so many things. So I'll try to mention the ones that, that come to the top of my head. Really, for us, what we've seen throughout the years is a continued normalization of gender-based discrimination and really the normalizing of harmful stereotypes that perpetuates the idea that women and girls and children should be subjugated, whereas men should have power and control. And this harms everyone. This isn't something that only harms women and children. It also harms men in the way that it really kind of puts people, as we call it, in a man box where men aren't able to live their full humanity. So when you hear people say things like boys will be boys, that's one of my favorite things to challenge people on, that you know, boys will be good humans just like girls will be. And being able to kind of break down those, those normalizations and gender stereotypes is really important. I think another thing that we see is just the language that's used around domestic violence. It can be really harmful. It can really remove some of the complexity of violence. And one of the things that people have started talking about more and more is that we see it referred to in the passive voice a lot of times. So, you know, women experience, one in four women experience violence. And you know, who are they experiencing that violence by? We're not talking about the perpetration of that abuse. It's a very much a passive voice that we're using. Uh, so really being able to talk about why violence is being used by people and the root of where that is coming from and those kind of historical gender norms that have continued to perpetuate that is really important. And then the final thing I would mention is that we continue to see misrepresentations of violence in the media, and news reporting in our TV shows and movies that we watch that are either trivializing violence or almost, you know, kind of making it this kind of exploitative nature of portraying violence and making it these kind of larger than life things when we're not talking about the real true complexities of what people experience in an intimate partner relationship that involves abuse. So I think there are a lot of places that we see this coming from, and those are just a few that I thought of. All right, very good. It's interesting you say that about the language. I had a meeting with someone who has been a champion for decades in our community against domestic violence. And she said back in her time, they called the survivors displaced homemakers, but they would never talk about how, what caused the displacement, who was doing something. They just jump up and leave, you know, everything they knew, but they no one could come to terms with this person's actions against this person that caused them to not to be unhoused. Okay. Sandra, your boots on the ground. Let me, what do you see as far as some of the societal issues? What are some of the things that the women talk about that really leads them to that, that think they have perpetuated domestic violence? Right. That's a good question. I just want to add on just because what I think Becky said was so foundational just to the culture and the collective understanding of what domestic violence and um, intimate partner violence is. And to add on to the language aspect of it, um, it is so true because we always hear, you know, well, what did you do, you know, or what did you do to provoke the situation? And that is not at all like trauma informed. Um, but I think um, what we see is that domestic violence happens across the spectrum and it can happen to anybody. And so um, when you talk about, um, you know, women's experiences specifically, I also um, think about the cultural background in the society when, um, you know, the cultural approach um, as far as like um, religious beliefs or cultural understanding of gender roles in a relationship. Um, and so when you share, um, we had a, a we had a client uh, who spoke Arabic and when she shared um, her reasons for why she didn't want to leave, you know, it, it makes sense on their side, you know, but for us, it, you know, sometimes I think we, we, we know the outcome and we want them to receive the outcome. But I think understanding that as a society, religious groups and cultural groups, like have an understanding of why people shouldn't leave. Um, and so another thing that I think, um, uh, is really good to, um, you know, from a shelter perspective, the main um, resource that people want is housing and safe housing. And so I think 
um, a societal issue is economic cost for housing and how difficult it is uh, for one person to uproot their lives and make a transition out uh, of a dangerous place. Um, we see now that a lot of women uh, are actually going outside of Nashville to Murfreesboro, um, Smyrna, you know, Madison area, because Nashville has become so expensive. Um, and thankfully, you know, we have some um, laws in place that, you know, can help, uh, you know, uh, transition women out a little bit easier. Um, we have the, you know, VAWA transfers, but even with that, sometimes there's barriers where um, there's not a unit available. So what now, right? And so I would definitely say economic costs have definitely um, hurt women um, and men and other uh, survivors of domestic violence in seeking safe shelter. All right, Tina, what larger societal issues have you seen that lead to the perpetuation of uh, domestic violence? It's, it's an excellent question, Sharon, and I concur thus far with Becky and Sandra's comments. I just want to add and emphasize, if I may, that domestic violence first is criminal. It's a crime. We don't say that enough. We need to uh, emphasize that domestic violence is a crime and that society has literally stated that it's okay. Uh, for domestic violence to happen. And the reason I say that is that uh, we are not keeping offenders accountable. That's a large issue for me. Um, I get the honor of overseeing our battle intervention programs, and I am working with the battle intervention directors and facilitators uh, to know and understand the importance of keeping victims safe first and then offender accountability. So I'm saying that to say that when society says it's okay, we tend to look at, for instance, the sentence. Uh, typically, if and when a domestic violence offender is sentenced, typically it's at 1129. And society thinks that's okay. I think that it should be at least a felony conviction. Um, so that these offenders can know that this is criminal and that it is not acceptable. So that's what I want to say first, that uh, we need to hold offenders accountable. Uh, we need to make sure that victims are safe and that domestic violence is a crime. When the legal system fails domestic violence victims, it fails our children. I think it was uh, Janet Reno, who was the first woman uh, attorney general who said, when we can combat the crimes in our homes, we will be able to tackle it on the streets. So it's over spilling into the streets from our home and the ramifications that domestic violence has on our children. And so that's a society issue that we need to tackle. We need to make sure that we are doing everything that we can do uh, to ensure that our children are safe and that our children are growing up in an environment that is conducive, that is palatable for their safety and for their growth. Uh, because if not, as we know, uh, children who witness domestic violence uh, grow up, uh, particularly uh, trying to offend, uh, offend. Uh, they don't do well in school. And so if we can protect our future, and, and, and invest in our future with these domestic violence cases, I think that we'll be better off. Well, let's dig a little deeper into that. What do you think are the most prevalent gaps? If let's say if we have a system and the system is not doing enough to hold, uh, I guess, abusers accountable, what are some of the uh, gaps? What are some of the things that we might think of advocating to do better? Is that for me? Tina, yeah. Yes, okay, very good. So we can always uh, improve on our services. We can improve first, Sharon, by uh, looking at elder abuse. We don't talk much about elder abuse. So I'm going from, from children all the way to the extreme with our elders. We don't talk much about elder abuse and it happens. And one of the things that we do know is that uh, there are, what, approximately 20 domestic violence offenses every minute in this country. 
And we know that some of those are uh, offenses against our elders, uh, offenses against our children. And so when we look at the gap, I want to just emphasize that victims, we don't acknowledge or explain that victims have rights, basic rights, children, domestic violence victims, elders. We need to acknowledge and explain because victims do have rights. They have a right to be treated with dignity and respect. That's a gap that needs to be closed. Uh, when, they, when victims don't know that they have a basic right, for instance, to restitution from the offender, that gap needs to be closed. Uh, they have a right to confer with the district attorney's office that needs to be explained. They have a right to be free from harassment and, and intimidation. Uh, they have a right to be at all proceedings if they desire. They even have a right to be heard. As you know, Sharon, 90% of all criminal cases are plea bargains. And when that happens, victims are extracted from the criminal process because they plead. And domestic violence victims sometimes don't even know that the person has pled or that the person was given 1129 probation sentence. And so we just need to close the gap in ensuring that victims have rights. We need to explain what those rights are to them in detail and allow them to be engaged in the process as much as they want to. Uh, again, victims, domestic violence victims, all victims, but particularly domestic violence victims have a right to be treated with dignity and respect. And once we get that out there, we will begin to close that gap when, when it comes to victims' rights. They have a right, again, I cannot stress this enough because when I was a probation officer, I'm really telling on myself back in my age, and when I was a probation officer, we had to collect fees from offenders. And a portion of those fees went to the Criminal Injuries Compensation Fund for crime victims. And so domestic violence victims, uh, in most cat cases, have a right to, excuse me, to restitution. So again, just closing the gap on uh, them knowing and understanding that they have rights. All right, Becky, I want you to go into detail on some of the things at the Family Safety Center. A lot of the issues that we still have here in Nashville are not necessarily available statewide, but some of those were addressed by some of the practices and procedures and programs at the Family Safety Center. Talk about some of those things working toward filling some of these gaps in the system that will help protect uh, victims. Yeah, absolutely. We the Office of Family Safety was really born out of an analysis of all of our gaps in the system around domestic violence. And so having roots in where we can improve has given us not only the space to open to wonderful family justice centers, but to also continue to work on those gaps. Uh, and as you know, Tina mentioned, they are plentiful in the criminal justice system. I would argue that while we see overcriminalization potentially in other types of crimes, we, we see undercriminalization in interpersonal violence. We see less prosecution, we see higher dismissal rates, less of the kind of practices that we want to see to make sure that offenders are held accountable for domestic violence and elder abuse and child abuse and human trafficking and sexual assault. So if you look at the rates at which we're really moving forward and holding offenders accountable in that way, it is very limited within the criminal justice system. So I'll just echo that first with Tina, um, you know, saying that victims have rights. Those rights are heavily outweighed in our criminal justice system by offenders' rights, unfortunately. And whether that's because we're not doing a good enough job of educating victims on their rights or we're not doing a good enough job of educating the courts, the prosecution, the defense, that victims also have rights. We also don't have a constitutional amendment that counterbalances the offenders' rights in the courts. So there's you know, been an effort for decades now trying to get a constitutional victim rights amendment that has consistently failed. And that's problematic if we have foundationally in our country the inability to pass a constitutional amendment to codify those victim rights, that, that shows that we're not believing victims and that we don't weigh them equally in the criminal justice system. So in Nashville with the Office of Family Safety, we've been able to 
take those gaps from that safety and accountability assessment and continue to work on those. One of those was the basic safety in the courthouse. And that's why we have the Gene Crow Advocacy Center so that when a victim or survivor is coming into the courthouse, they have a space where they can wait for court that's safe, they can receive services, they can speak with the district attorney if they choose to, and they're not being intimidated by the perpetrator, by their family, their friends, and they have a space that they can basically be free from harassment, as Tina said, which is one of their rights. So that was really born out of that assessment. And then our continual work to close those gaps is oftentimes centered around our community collaboration with each other. How are we making sure that these highest risk clients are receiving wraparound services? And how do we make sure our legal system is really implementing the law? So one of the biggest gaps we continue to have is around our firearms dispossession. So Tennessee is one of the states that has both state and federal law that prohibits people who are convicted of domestic violence misdemeanors and people who have full orders of protection against them, they are prohibited by law from owning or possessing a firearm. But the implementation of that law is very convoluted. So making sure that we're actually removing that firearm is constantly in question. There are constant barriers that come up from the point of arrest all the way until conviction or the order of protection. So for example, we've been working with partners for six years on trying to get that dispossession really happening. And we're starting to see some movement from our judges where they're holding compliance hearings to say, you say that you have a firearm, you need to come back to court and show that you've actually dispossessed yourself of that firearm. In our office, we also do extensive research on every person who's showing up for a docket the next day. So we flag if they have any evidence of a firearm, any evidence of other high-risk behaviors such as strangulation, and make sure that the DAs, probation, that our advocates, our civil legal attorneys all have that information so that in court they can say, judge, this person has evidence that they have a firearm. It was mentioned in the order of protection, or it was even mentioned in the criminal warrant that they use this firearm, and they're now saying they don't have it. So just continuing that what we call patient persistent work. It can be pretty slow, especially in a state like Tennessee where firearms are upheld, um, but firearms are illegal for people who use abuse and are convicted of that abuse. And we have to implement those state and federal laws to make sure we're really doing our best to keep victims safe. All right, uh, uh, Sandra, just as we talk some about the services, it was very important for people to understand what the Family Safety Center is trying to do for this community and what they do for this community. Now you are residential services at the Weaver Domestic Violence Center. Uh, that's part of the YWCA. It's been in operation for 22 years. A little bit off what we were discussing, let's talk about the women that actually need shelter. They come into the Weaver Center. What do we do to center these survivors, to help these survivors? Good question. Um, I just want to also start off by saying that um, I think it's important for um, people to know that when, um, you know, we also take men uh, into our shelter as well. And so how we accommodate our men is we uh, place them in a hotel. Um, and so our women, anybody who identifies as a woman, so we've had uh, transgender women come into shelter before, we've placed like trans men in hotels as well. And so I think it's just important to reiterate that. Um, but really how we, uh, our process when we bring, um, you know, callers into, into shelter is to first, um, it starts with the, it starts with the call. You know, I think it's always good to know um, that making a call to a shelter is a very brave thing to do. Um, and it's not easy and it's very, um, it can be very shameful, very embarrassing. Um, and sometimes uh, when um, clients call looking for shelter, their memory is just everywhere. And so we're really learning here um, at the YW to be mindful of that, that stories aren't always going to be linear. You know, all of the details aren't always, aren't always going to be in order. Um, you know, trauma has that effect, um, you know, on the brain where memories are scattered. And I think um, starting with that understanding um, and really believing, you know, um, 
our callers when they share their stories. Um, so that's definitely a very foundational step uh, when bringing women in. Um, we also, within the shelter, offer case management. Uh, so um, they're equipped where um, with a, they're assigned to a, ca a case manager that really helps them navigate the process just because there are so many things to do to get done within um, the time frame of 60 days. And so actually, um, you know, our shelter went from being 45 days to 60 days, and we're actually expanding it now um, to 75 days uh, with one extension for 15 days. And the reason we decided to do this was because um, it, we were getting close to the 60 day mark and we were realizing that people were so close to getting housing. They were waiting for that Section 8 voucher to come through. They were waiting, um, you know, for that approval letter. Um, you know, we have a lot of women who are also working with other housing agencies here um, that are referred through coordinated entry. And so that's, you know, a way that we help our women navigate that as well within shelter. But we found that, um, it typically that little sweet spot with 75 days is is more of the average time when um, they move into safe housing. And so we decided to, you know, adjust that recently. It actually got approved yesterday. <laughs> so um, we're really grateful that we get to give them a little bit more time um, just because, you know, with housing and the housing crisis in Nashville, it takes time. Um, and so on a more direct level, um, we also, we've had a family therapist on site and we are in the process of hiring another therapist to work with our single ladies. Um, I will say going forward, um, just as we share um, equal services, you know, for men and women, um, uh, I, I do think that we could, you know, expand those therapist uh, therapy services to our um, men who are housed in our hotels as well. Um, and so we're growing, we're continuing to, you know, uh, see ways that, um, you know, we can better serve our, our clients. Okay, I'm going to go back to this. I'll go back to you, Tina. Uh, we hear a lot of data about what appears to be uh, a disproportionate level of domestic violence against people of color. I'll say both brown and black people. We know that society access to economic opportunities, building intergenerational wealth, healthcare, education, uh, all of those societal ills that we've discussed have created uh, problems for marginalized communities. We look at the LGBTQ community, we look at disabled individuals because often we don't look at those. What are some things that you think that we need to do as a society to make sure that these groups who have been otherwise marginalized can also be protected from domestic violence? Very good question, Sharon. You're just full of good questions on this afternoon. First of all, I think that uh, the lack of consistency of quality services rendered, um, and I'm going to give you a point in case in uh, just please hear my heart on this. I really want you all to hear my heart. Uh, June of 2013, uh, we remember, we reflect on um, an Ivy League school in this area where there was a rape on campus. And we know what happened. We, we are thankful that there were convictions. What I want us to really look at is the difference in how and this is no reflection on the victim. Please hear my heart on this. I want us to look at the disparity. This particular victim was uh, given everything that she needed to be made whole again. She got counseling. She got therapy. Um, she was surrounded with victim services, resources. Um, she stayed in contact and they stayed in contact with her after she relocated. And so when it came down to the trial, and as we know, there were several trials, um, she was well prepared uh, emotionally, mentally, socially, all those things, even financially. And so I'm, I'm saying that to say that if every victim, every domestic violence victim, every sexual assault victim, every victim would be treated like she was treated, we will have a better society with making our victims whole again, or at least uh, to the extent where they can rebound um, and, 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 and get the necessary help. When we don't, we fail them. So I looked at that case. I looked at how uh, this particular victim was treated. And I thought if every victim 
would be treated like this if every victim would have the level of resources uh, that she was able to avail herself to and the support that she had, it would be a better society. So when we look at um, African-Americans, those who are disabled, the LGBT community, those victims need the same level of support without judgment, without victim blaming, without making it seem like it's their fault. So we need to look at our system, look at how we are deliberately showing a difference in our victims and educate ourselves on the fact that every victim, again, needs to be treated with dignity and respect. And I cannot say that enough. And every victim needs the same level of support that uh, a victim was given in 2013. Again, I want you to hear my heart on that. I don't want anyone to think that that's a reflection on the victim. It is not. She deserved everything that she got. And every victim, domestic violence victim, deserves the same level of treatment. Thank you. We, we have a board member and his daughter was a victim of a significant domestic violence. And he acknowledges that because of his resources, financially and also societal resources, he was able to do certain things for his daughter. They were able to let her have the opportunity to psychologically heal. They were able to, you know, work it so she could go back to school after a period of healing. So they were willing, they got her all kinds of counseling. They were able to get her a safe place to live. And he said, when he talks about the YW and the Weaver Center, we need to be able to provide that for everyone not just for people who are privileged like his daughter was. Yes. All right, Becky, let's talk about some of these marginalized groups. Are there any sort of special programs, any sort of special efforts that we as a community can take to support them? I think it's really important to remove barriers as much as we can, both with access to service provision, provision and the criminal justice system. So we know that there are a lot of barriers that come up from historical racism, and the you know, current situation with police violence against black men and women. And I think it's really important that we recognize those barriers and the access to criminal justice that our clients are going to feel. So will they reach out to police? Is that something that they'll consider? Or instead, will they reach out to the YWCA's hotline? Or will they come into the Family Justice Center? How can we provide entry points that make it so they have credible messengers that can help lead them through a system and maybe connect them at some point with the criminal justice system if that's what they choose. But we have to recognize the barriers that exist, the language barriers that exist for many of our clients, making sure that we have accessible services for individuals who are differently abled. So all of those things are really important in, in educating practitioners in our field and knowing how to be culturally, um, how to have cultural humility, how to have accessible services, and how to make sure that we're peeling down those barriers as much as we can. And I want to, you know, just point out that when we see the impact of violence against women in particular, it disproportionately impacts women who are as you said, Sharon, women who are black and brown. So women of color are impacted at much greater rates. And we also need to do things to educate about that and to really increase our awareness and outreach. So we have outreach programs here at the Office of Family Safety. They're really specific to underserved communities. I think that's important for all of us to work together and really amplifying that voice because black women are murdered at rates much higher than white women in Nashville. Uh, similarly, nationally, we see Native American women and girls experiencing violence and being murdered by men at much higher rates. The same thing we can see in the Latinx community, um, especially with the, the rates of murder are slightly higher than white women. So I think it's really important that we have more education around that and start to do more outreach based on what we know and how we can remove those barriers. All right, and Sandra, earlier you mentioned uh, sort of a, almost a cultural or religious barrier for the individual even seeking help. Talk a little bit about how some of these brown and black or other communities might hesitate 
to seek help based on the societal issues? Mm, that's a really good question. And I think it comes down to uh, two things and that's uh, a sense of safety and trust. Um, and I know we had mentioned language barriers, which, you know, Nashville, um, you know, is growing by the day. And so we are, you know, having a larger Arabic community and not just speaking Arabic, but also speaking Turkish and speaking um, just, you know, different types of languages that, you know, uh, we haven't heard of dialects. Um, and so really depending and training uh, staff on how to, um, you know, use the language line and maximize the language line. Um, I know, um, we've had, I think, for the for the Latin community, I will say, um, it's really important to educate them of their rights, because there still remains a fear of, you know, is my partner going to get deported? Um, that fear is, uh, it's very <laughs> real, and more common, you know, than we think, and it really prevents uh, women from seeking help and from seeking legal help. Um, and so going back to um, education, I think is very important. Um, I will say for um, the the Arabic clients that I have worked with, and it's there's been there's been several in the past few years. Um, it comes back to um, you know just a very um, rooted uh, you know they they've been ingrained with this you know their whole life. Uh, on why not to leave on what why to stay and why to be uh you know continue with that gender role within your family more of like what 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 would i do if i if i tear my children apart from their father right um and so what i've seen um is that women go back and women come back and we all know that sometimes it takes six to seven times for someone to fully leave you know a domestic violence relationship but i think each time um continuing to encourage them uh to be brave in their decisions but always making them aware of of their options and their rights um i think just with the concept of centering survivors, allow them to lead the way, you know, allow them to make choices. I think one of the biggest things that I've seen is, you know, they depend so much on advocates and they want advocates to make the choice for them. But really uh, when having those conversations, you know, center it back to, you know, what would you like to do? Let's figure that out together. Let's create, you know, a, a support map for you. Um, and so I just, uh, I just want to say, you know, to everybody who's worked with, you know, different uh, marginalized communities, you know, continue to to empower them to really use their voice and to educate them. All right, I'm going to ask you all a question, and these are experts, so I can go all over and just ask them questions that are not necessarily they had before. But this is the question that I get asked more than any other question when they know about our services for domestic violence victims. I'm going to start with you, Tina. Why don't these women just leave? Why don't they get out of this situation? What's your perspective? Yes, and, and I too, Sharon, get that question often. In fact, we call it the million dollar question. Why are they there? One of the things that we do know is that domestic violence is about power and control. Um, it's a, a pattern of abuse. And so um, if you look at uh, going out on a date uh, for the very first time, uh, there is no emotional attachment there. And so if uh, the offender abuses, uh, I say for me on the first date, I'm out of there, right? Uh, I'm calling the police, I'm calling my brothers, I'm calling uh, my peeps, right? And say, hey, he, he abused me. So there is no emotional attachment there. What we see in that cycle of violence is that um, there is this honeymoon stage or phase where he's kind, he's gentle, he's gregarious, he's lovable, he's providing uh, gifts, he's doing all the right things that uh, allows her to buy in emotionally. And so it's called grooming. And before you know it, she's hooked. And he, on the second stage, he begins to uh, maybe shout. There is no hitting at this point. He's he's getting to, to shout. She's looking and seeing the red flags, but she is emotionally invested at this point. He's going to change. And he even says, you made me yell. So she believes it. 
And then we go to what he physically abuses. And we do know that domestic violence is not about just physical abuse. There is emotional, because that's where it starts. Emotional, mental, uh, social, uh, spiritual, financial, so on and so forth. So the reason why they don't leave is because there is an emotional attachment, just like anything else that we have, right? And I want to say this too, Sharon, when, when a man's wallet is stolen, we don't ask him, what were you wearing? We don't ask him, what were you doing for your wallet to be stolen? We express sympathy. Oh my goodness. And empathy. Oh my goodness. Somebody's going to know where he lives. And someone has stolen his credit cards. We only ask why does she leave or what was she wearing for domestic and sexual assault victims? And we have got to educate uh, society that those questions are not relevant at all. We need to be asking, why does he batter? Okay, Becky, what do you yes. feel? When you get asked that question, what's your response? Tina, it's a tough act to follow. <laughs> I'll just try to, to add a little bit to that. I think the basis of that question involves so much victim blaming, like Tina alluded to just now. Um, and so it can be really tricky not to just be like, well, that's extremely victim blaming of you. And, and it's also really otherizing. And it's something that, not to get too researchy, but we've started to see people research the reason why people victim blame. Because this has an impact not only in people understanding domestic violence, but in our conviction rate. So if you have a juror who's sitting on a jury listening to these choices that were made by a domestic violence survivor, a sexual assault survivor, and they're thinking those things, you know, why would she have made that choice and that choice versus the man whose wallet is stolen? That's why we see such low conviction rates with interpersonal abuse with domestic violence, sexual assault, human trafficking, because we have this pervasiveness of victim blaming that comes from what they've found is really a safety mechanism. It's us as human beings saying, I don't, I need to otherize and kind of distance myself from this experience someone else has had where they have been abused, they've fallen prey to a trafficker, they have been sexually assaulted, to provide myself with some psychological safety that this isn't going to happen to me. So I'm going to make the assumption that someone is making bad choices. And that's why they're not leaving because they've made all these bad choices instead of it being, as Tina said, a cycle that develops over time that involves complex trauma bonding. And then it also involves incredibly high risk situations. It is the most deadly time when someone chooses to leave an abusive situation. So trivializing all of that and trying to kind of distance ourselves as humans from someone else's experience really feeds into that question. So I think what we can do besides jumping to saying, well, that's incredibly victim blaming is instead to say, you know, this is something that's really complicated and it's not something that occurs on the first date. It's something that develops over time and involves so many different things that that person is making choices about. Of do How do I protect my children? Is it best to stay? Will that actually protect them better than leaving? Because if I leave, he might kill us all. So maybe I'm making the safest choice for myself by staying right now until I can figure out the pathway to leave. So it, it involves an incredible amount of empathy to understand why someone doesn't leave because it means really understanding them as a full human and that situation is very complex. All right, Sandra, Sandra, not only why don't they just leave, but as you said before, why do they leave? Why, when they leave, why do they go back? Which mm -hmm. is even more complicated. Right. I just want to echo Tina and Becky, your answers were excellent. Um, and I had um, an interaction with a, uh, with a resident, um, I think about a month ago, and in our intake packet, um, which, you know, we're, we're working on revising as well, we have to collect, uh, collect abuser information or offender information. And so when I was filling this intake pack packet out with uh, the client, they stopped and, you know, she shared with me, she was like, you know what, 
like, wow, like I've never thought about him as an abuser or I've never thought about him as an offender. Um, and that really just kind of hit me in the moment because, you know, she shared that's, you know, this has been the love of her life, right? This has been, you know, uh, her partner, the father of her children, um, the person that she's lived with for years. And I think on our side as advocates um, and in this field, we often sometimes uh, normalize, you know, just using the word abuser or offender, which they, they, they are an offender, right? If they commit a crime. Um, but I think understanding where, you know, they are on their side where they might not be ready to recognize that um, this person is an abuser um, and it, it's going to take some time, you know, and unfortunately, um, you know, obviously we don't want them, you know, to return back home. Um, but I think the reasons people do is, you know, um, you know, like Tina shared, they, they've already been in that power and control cycle for a while and they're still holding on to hope. You know, I think um, one of the beautiful things about humans as is, is that sometimes we we're designed to have hope. And so, um, wanting to go back can look like, you know, financial stability. It can look like my children being with their father. Um, I can't tell you how many times uh, children come into shelter and ask about their dad, want to talk about their dad. And, you know, to create that safe space for moms, you know, um, who don't want to talk about it, you know, sometimes we, you know, we have to, you know, reshape conversations with children. Um, and so it's, it's difficult. And so like Becky said, it's complex, you know, there, it's not a linear answer. Um, there are so many layers, uh, especially if, you know, every case is so different, everybody's experience is so different. So I would definitely say, uh, come with the mindset so that it's complex, um, and survivors, you know, always, um, have the, I think somebody once told me, you know, we have to trust that survivors have the skills to, uh, to provide safety for themselves and to, to be resilient. And so, um, coaching them through those conversations on, okay, so let me know, tell me what would happen if you go, what's your plan? Um, and really seeing them play it out in their mind, um, a lot like motivational interviewing, tell me what will happen when you go back. And so I think that's been, um, we've had some level of success, you know, and unfortunately we can't stop people, but I will say it does start with having an understanding um, that it's a complex situation. All right, I'll go back to you, Tina. We always like for the panelists as part of our series to really give the community members some, some, some direct guidance. What can community members do to continue to support victims of domestic violence? Let's say I'm sitting on this call, I'm listening to all this good advice, I see these services. What can I do as an individual to help my community support survivors? Yeah, just another excellent question. The first thing we should do is to listen. Uh, listen attentively and listen with compassion and not listen with trying to provide an answer, but listen attentively. And then secondly, validate. Uh, we need to validate the victim's experiences. If they tell us that they are being abused, we should believe them. Uh, we should not be judgmental. Uh, we should ask, uh, what more can I do to help you in this situation? Um, and then also uh, know where to point someone for help. And so we need to equip ourselves with the knowledge and the information so that if someone does uh, need help. One of the, 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 the beauties of this business, Sharon, is for me, uh, watching the video uh, that uh, Governor Lee signed into uh, legislation effective January of this year, and just having an environment where the stylists and barbers uh, can provide wholesome information, uh, correct information uh, to those persons who are coming in to get their hair did or get a, a haircut. We know that that environment is just open for all kinds of conversations. If you want to hear conversations, go to a hair salon, you will be able to hear just an array of things, but equipping, equipping now the stylists and the barbers uh, to be able to uh, shed some light on domestic violence, uh, point them in the right direction. Um, and then finally, I wanna say, when we are dealing with uh, these kinds of issues, keep an open heart, keep an open heart, be as compassionate as you know, 
when I was the state director of victim services with the parole board, I had the honor of overseeing about 25 victim coordinators. And one of the things that I told them is that I can train you on being a victim coordinator, but I cannot train you on having compassion. It comes from within. I think it was Theodore Roosevelt, which is another one of my favorite quotes. I think he coined the phrase that no one cares how much you know until they know how much you care. So we have to be caring. We have to be, again, just an attentive listener so that we can aid them in the right direction. So again, just listen attentively, validate their experiences, ask what more uh, you could do to aid them, know where to point them in the right direction, and then finally, keep an open heart. All right, and Becky, to you, what can community members do? Uh, one thing they can do is to access information about the uh, uh, Family Safety Center, which was a good start, but what can individuals in the community do to support survivors and even someone, let's say you're at work and someone in your office, you know, is a victim, what, what can you do to support them? So I think, where Tina started is really important. Just that validation has such a huge impact across time for people who've experienced abuse. So being heard, being listened to without judgment has impacts in that person's healing journey that are incredibly important. And I think it's also important for community members to recognize that the issue of abuse is something that impacts everyone and to carry that message along to their community. So domestic violence impacts our healthcare systems. It impacts our workplaces. So there's millions and billions of dollars that are lost every year in the state of Tennessee and nationally and internationally and people who are unable to work due to domestic violence. So it is, it's incredibly important to show how it has ripple effects, not only in our economic sector and our health sector, but also in our general public safety. So oftentimes there's again, that kind of trivialization of domestic violence or this idea that it's private and should be kept in the home. Domestic violence spills out into our communities every single day. The majority of mass violence perpetrators are targeting an intimate partner or family member. So if we try to kind of divorce domestic violence from public safety, it is our primary public safety issue that we should be concerned with because of how prevalent it is, because of how much it impacts our entire public safety. So I think really encouraging buy-in from not only yourself, but from other community members and challenging these ideas that come up of victim blaming, challenging ideas around this kind of normalizing of these negative stereotypes. So when you hear somebody say, boys will be boys, how do you challenge that? How do you talk about boys as full humans, as boys and men who have full humanity and who don't have to choose to use abuse, who can be loving, caring, wonderful partners? Um, how do we start to challenge those things in our everyday conversation? It can feel a little uncomfortable, but I promise you it is so important and it will truly have an impact. Maybe not in that moment, but what you say will stick with someone. So challenge those notions um, and really encourage people to take on this issue as their own because it impacts everyone. That's very important. In fact, a few years ago, the YW started a program because we wanted to engage men in these conversations because men need to hold other men accountable. It, uh, for unacceptable behavior. There was a sort of acceptance, like you said, boys will be boys. We're just all in the locker room having fun, which really has an effect of, of making women lesser than. And so you have to challenge that. Men have to challenge it. Women have to challenge it. We as a society have, have, they have to challenge it. And Sandra, getting to that same question, you see individuals uh, who are going back to a community. And what if you had a relative or friend knowing that an individual has come back to a situation, what advice would you give them for someone who has left and then they're coming back? What advice would you give to our community to help support that 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 survivor? Yeah, definitely. Two things. Um, I would definitely say, you know, be a safe person. And that means uh, no judgment, uh, even if they return. Um, what that looks like is 
you know, you could reach out um, in a very soft way um, just for the safety of, you know, your friend and just make your presence in their lives. So they know that whenever they're ready to make a choice going forward, that, you know, they, they would, they'll, they'll know where to turn. Um, I think my second advice would be to stay connected to resources, stay connected to the community, um, informed. Uh, things are always changing and updating. So I think it's really good to be, you know, up to date with resources. Um, I think community members, um, you know, sometimes feel the weight and the pressure to want to help, you know, their friends throughout the whole process. And I love that about our community who has such a big heart. Um, it's okay not to, it's okay to, to refer out, um, you know, to people. Um, and I said, so, so kind of going back to uh, staying connected as a community, um, you know, if you don't have an answer, it's okay, but, you know, just know that you can refer them to uh, people that do. Um, so I think it's as simple as that. All right, thank you all. There are a couple of notes that were in the chat. There are, there's an 800 number and a text line at the YW. The one thing I will caution everyone is to make sure you keep yourself safe, as well as those that are your friends that could be victims of domestic violence. Because as we have talked about in this conversation, I always tell people this, when a person decides they want to leave a circumstance, make sure they do it safely. Because as the people on this call know, and as we know at the YW, that is a very dangerous time. And you have to make sure that you understand the signs and make sure they know how to go about doing this correctly. Because we don't want to lose another life to domestic violence that we can save. Uh, there are a lot of things. I would recommend you to be in touch with any of these women for additional information. I will say one thing that is very, very significant is something that Becky teaches you, and we don't have time to get into on this call about strangulation. That seems like a very difficult subject. It seems like something that's really crazy to center on and focus on. But if you can understand that one element of the danger of domestic violence, it will go a long way into helping a, save a lot of lives in our community. So I thank these panelists. This has been fabulous. And hopefully someone in this audience has gained an insight into this very critical mission, very critical subject, because it is something that we're gonna to have to tackle as a community. So we need to stand with these survivors. We need to understand this is a very difficult, very complex circumstance. But I think together, if we work and educate the community, we can do a lot of things to keep a lot of people safe. So. Thank you all for your time. And thank you all for being here at the YWCA Stand Against Injustice um, conversation today. So thank you.